morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm George Moss again here at AllPointsTV.com and also WFOV 92.1 on your radio dial. And we're glad to have them, as always, partnering with us here at AllPointsTV.com. I'm back now from a 10-day hiatus in Africa, and I am very glad to be back. Went to uh, one of the poorer countries on the uh, African continent, Gambia, and that is supposed to be the place in which Alex Haley's, Alex Haley's ancestor, Kunti Kenti, uh, came from, according to Alex Haley's uh, novel that was um, written in 1976. And you probably remember the TV series, the 12 hour series uh, called Roots, where Alex Haley claimed that he traced his roots back to the Jufere village uh, in Gambia. So I went there, and um, every year in Gambia, they have the Alex Haley, um, I guess you have to call it the Alex Haley Festival, the Kunti Kenti Festival in uh, Gambia, where they're celebrating this commercializing <laughs> of Alex Haley's nonsense. In fact, I had a discussion while I was in uh, Gambia with uh, one person that was there in Gambia at the time that I was there at the uh, villa where I was staying. And uh, this person was from uh, the, the country next door, Senegal, in Senegal, which surrounds uh, Gambia on three sides. Gambia is landlocked except uh, for its outlet to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So on three sides, uh, it's surrounded by Senegal. And one of the persons, because the countries are so close, one of the persons that was there was uh, from Senegal. And we were talking about... Um, a, a number of things, but one of the things that came up was this Alex Haley, uh, this, commodi this commodification of Alex Haley's uh, novel. And he was telling me that uh, every year he comes over and when the Americans come over and they join in the celebration of Kunti Kenti and they have the Kunti Kenti Festival in Gambia and uh, they have a, a great celebration, it's a wonderful event and so on and so forth. So I asked him if he was now living in the same place that he was born in, in Senegal, uh, or has his family moved out of that area. And he told me he was born in Dakar and he had moved to another location in, um, in the Senegalese state. And I asked him about his friends, who, since he was a businessman, I asked him, how many of his friends would also have the same testimony about where they live uh, today and where they were born and have they moved? And he told me that um, they would have been um, in a different place now from where they were located when they were born. And so the question came up then, how is it that Alex Haley's uh, ancestors would have been in the same place 300 years later and that Alex Haley was able, <laughs> this is funny, uh, Alice Haley would have traced his roots all the way back to the Jufre village where nobody in Alex Haley's family had moved uh, since the uh, 1700s. And he went back to that village and found his kin still there waiting for him to arrive. It was so, it was so much nonsense that I had to point that out uh, in that uh, discussion that I had with this uh, person when I began to talk to him about it. Uh, to explain uh, how ludicrous the, the assumption is and how Alex Haley is nothing but a fraud, uh, they were, they had their mouths open. Another uh, mouth opening conversation that I had there was one at the, um, at the exchange bank where you exchange the money. And um, I had promised this one guy that I was going to come back, come back and do business with him in terms of converting American dollars into the uh, the currency in Gambia, which is the, is the dollar C. We have the dollar, they have the dollar C. And I had exchanged money at another place. I forgot where I was, and I did not go to the one where I promised to do the exchange. So I had to now, uh, when I passed by this one place, I exchanged money. And then when I passed by the one I had promised to change money by, I had to uh, keep my word, I went in that place and changed money as well. At that particular place, there was a person that recognized uh, me from past visits in 2015, and he asked me 
about uh, Donald Trump. And he said, uh, what do you think about Donald Trump? And I told him that I'm going to answer his question, but I'm not going to give him the answer that, that he expects. And I started off by telling him, first, first and foremost, you have to understand that the media that is reporting nationally and internationally on, on Donald Trump, that the media is lying on Donald Trump. And so I'm not going to give you the, um, the mountaintop view of this president, that he's a racist, that he is a homophobic, he is um, xenophobic, and all these other phobias that you have if you are not a Democrat. None of the Democrats have these, uh, these phobias. Only the Republicans have it. And if you are not a, uh, a Democrat, then you are, if you're black, you're an Uncle Tom, and if you're white, you're a racist. And so all this nonsense that passes for information, I wanted to um, intervene in that conversation and tell them that you ask a question, I'm going to give you an answer, but you're not going to like the answer I'm going to give you because I know exactly why you asked me that question. And the answer to the question is not going to be one of your, of your liking. <clears throat> that Donald Trump has been misrepresented by the American media and he's been misrepresented by the international media that's picked up on this noise that's being made here in the United States. This idea that Donald Trump, who is improving the condition of blacks in this country much more than Barack Obama did, who has lowered the unemployment rate, is doing it because he's a racist, let me, uh, let me uh, see if I can um, go back a little bit in history to, to show how those that had a racist, racist overview toward uh, blacks, treated blacks when they were in power. Let's take, for example, the Democrats. Their racism was such that they had blacks on the plantations of this country in 11 states that succeeded from the Union, not because of slavery. This accession was not um, because of slavery, which would have been acceptable in the Union prior to 1861. That's not why they, they left the Union. They left the Union because they were succeeding for the same reason why the Framers had um, succeeded from Great Britain. This was another tax war in 1861. But the party that maintained slavery was a Democratic Party. And the first Democrat was Andrew Jackson the seventh president of the United States who came into office in 1829 and was elected to two terms and left office in 1837. That's the Andrew Jackson that headed the, was the first president of the Democratic Party. And it was that party, there was a party of slavery and later on the party of Jim Crow, the party of segregation, the party of black sitting in the back of the bus, but none of the ones in the Democratic Party today were racist. All the Democrats there were races entered into the Republican Party, and that's where they are right now, according to the narrative. And I wanted this person to know in Gambia that I do not carry that water because that, that analysis of history is incorrect, and I'm here to tell anyone that um, denies that to prove your claims. Show me your evidence. Only two races... Democrats went into the Republican Party. I'm talking about those members that were part of the segregationist group back in the day when the uh, races were out of the woodwork beating down on blacks. The only two persons that went from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, now that I'm advocating the Republican Party, I want to make that clear as well. But only two persons went from the Democratic Party into the uh, uh, from the Democratic Party into Republican Party, and that was Watson and Thurman. Strom Thurman, if you remember, in 1948, ran on the Democratic ticket and almost caused the loss of Truman in the election of 1948. When he looked at the very beginning, that Dewey had beat, beat Truman because of the division in the Democratic Party, where Strom Thurman had divided. Uh, the, Demo the, well, the Democrats were divided 
and the Dixiecrats, which were the Southern uh, Democrats, were voting, uh, I think there were 48 electoral votes taken away from, um, from Truman by the candidacy of Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond later on would go and join the Republican Party and was one of the persons, by the way, that led the, the vote to vote for Clarence Thomas, one of the great justices on the Supreme Court. I know you don't like me saying that, but I don't care if you like it or not. A lot of things I'm going to be talking about today you will not like. <clears throat> because I got over there in Africa, and I saw real poverty, real um, uh, problems, not these made-up problems that people are talking about over here as they're whining and making up stuff and then fighting a narrative that, that they're making up and uh, has nothing to do with the reality in 2018 here in the United States. I'm here to tell you about it in case you don't know. And I don't care if you like it or not. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just like Malcolm X, I guess, in this sense. I remember Malcolm X uh, making a speech called um, Message to the Grassroots. Malcolm X's speech was made, uh, I think it was November the, November the uh, 10th, uh, 19... Uh, 63, Malcolm's last, Malcolm X's last speech as a member of the Nation of Islam. And Malcolm said that, he said in that speech, he said to those people out there that he knew that they did like, not like what he was saying, but he said that he's not the kind of person to say what you like. He said that I'm going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. And that was Malcolm at his best. There are some hard truths we're going to have to talk about in this country, and we're not talking about any of those truths. But listen to these airheads like Michael Eric Dyson, and I don't know who uh, has appointed LeBron James, who, who's an airhead, personified in front of the camera making a fool of himself. And then those that criticize those pastors that met with a man that has reduced the unemployment rate among, the, uh, among blacks in this country. It's the lowest rate it's ever been in the history of this country since slavery. And they, are, and they are out here apologizing for meeting with the man that caused the condition of black America to improve. And they are apologizing for meeting with the man that's improving the black, the black condition. You think, they, you, think these people might, uh, you think these people want to improve the black condition? If they wanted to improve the black condition, they'd be commending Donald Trump for the job he's doing, but that's not going to happen. But you know, but when it comes to economics, I mean, some people pointed out when um, Bush was in office and the economic crisis uh, developed, you know, in 2008, you know, 2007, 2008, and then, um, you know, Obama inherited, the, you know, a mess. But then again, they were crediting him for improving the, uh, Obama for improving the, um, you know, the economy. But um, basically, all he had done is just basically allow the people already in there working with Bush to do what they were doing which I, I had some issues with what they did anyway, but I mean, um, they basically, they're like, they, they act like, it's like Obama did a great thing appointing these people when he hadn't done that in the first place. And another thing is he just stayed the course of, you know, of, of handling things that are already established by the previous administration. Yeah, he was, he was a credit, he was credit for saving the, uh, the economy. I'm thinking I'm puzzled by that. I'm Obama, really puzzled by that. Uh, to talk about uh, Donald Trump over in Africa was also to bring a discussion, therefore, of my views on Barack Obama. Because if you are saying things that are different from what the narrative is about Donald Trump, then, of course, the question they're going to raise then, then how did you feel about Barack Obama? I have a narrative about that as well. I think Obama was terrible. They're talking about uh, um, uh, that Trump is a disaster in this country. He's not a disaster for the country, to the country as far as bringing the economy back and also not a disaster from the country, for the country in terms of bringing this country back from the brink. You can't even imagine what this country would look like right now if the uh, other competitor had won that election. That is in terms of uh, Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. I can't even imagine. I don't want to imagine what the country would look like under these um, Sololinskites, under these socialists. And you're now beginning to see who these people are because what has happened with Donald Trump is that a lot of the persons that were in the woodwork, that were in the background, not revealing who they are, what has happened with Donald Trump is that Donald Trump has brought these persons out into the open so you can see what's behind their mask. <clears throat> and we are not yet far enough away from the event in order to see the kind of 
role that's being played by Donald Trump, but Donald Trump is a transformative president that pulled this country from the brink. I, I, this goes to show me, though, that their anchor is at a person who's basically under his watch. The, 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 you know, the lot of people's lives have been improved. They still have animosity. It just goes to show you they always want a crisis. They always want to be able to monopolize that and capitalize it and to exploit it. They don't want people to have a good life. They want to be always, always the people that you go to like some kind of parent. And I think that shit right there, anybody who's got a working brain cell or two should say, why aren't they happy about this? Why isn't being self-sufficient for these people a good thing? Why isn't that a good thing? And then they should start having this epiphany that they don't want you to do well. You know, they don't. Uh, John... The politicians in this country, the politicians that are uh, in Africa, the politicians in Asia, I don't care where you find them, they're all the same. Politicians are not great, and, and I'm not saying Donald Trump is great. Je Donald Trump is transformative. He's a transformative president. Only the, uh, only the producers are great. Politicians are not great. And we've only had, I, I was watching a video before I came to the studio talking about the 10 uh, greatest presidents in American history. And that site, you know, you watch these videos, but that site was really hard to, to watch. It was only about 10 minutes long, but it's hard to stay tuned to that for 10 minutes. These politicians, no, there's only one great politician in American history. Only one. And we've had 45, 44 different ones, but 45 in terms of the non-consecutive terms of Grover Cleveland, who was elected in 1884, and then again in 1892. Benjamin Harrison coming between those two terms. And uh, so he's the 22nd president, talking about Grover Cleveland, and he's also the 24th president. But we've had 44 different persons in the, in the Oval Office, but we've had 45 presidents because of the non-consecutive terms of Grover, of Grover Cleveland. And this idea that you can list the 10 great presidents or the 10 worst presidents, they've all been bad. There's only one. <laughs> I mean, presidents are not great. Um, uh, I noticed on that one list, this guy had the 10 uh, most outstanding presidents. He had on that list, he had um, number three, he had Calvin Coolidge. And um, Calvin Coolidge would say that one of the things that he did was he was able to mind his own business. Uh, that makes him a, a president that you can uh, tolerate his uh, hands off because that's what government is designed, that's what the frame is designed for government to do, to leave us alone. That's what government should be doing, to keep the hands off of the American people's rights and keep their hands out of the American people's pockets. And they won't even do that. Limited government. You know, usually a president is considered great because they were responding to a crisis that maybe somebody else who was in the office prior to him helped set the stage for. And then they turn around and create another set of circumstances <laughs> and cat cat you know, catastrophic things that the other one all has to deal with. Now they're all considered great because they dealt with these issues that because of stirring the pot up, it actually was caused by. But now they're they're, they're basically self-fulfilling self aggrand self -aggr you know, aggrandizers. They look how great I did. You wouldn't, we wouldn't have had this. This guy before you didn't do this, and you guys didn't do this afterwards. Is set it up for the stage for the next one to have to be a great president. I don't like great presidents. I like ones that kind of meld into the background. That's uh, what John, I like. That uh, it's impossible. All all politicians, and I'm including the ones in in Gambia. Uh, we they got rid of uh, the one that I was that was there when I was in Gambia in 2015. Uh, they they have uh, uh, boroughs in there now. Uh, they had um, um, El Haji uh, Yahya uh, Jamey, who was president in uh, 2015. They finally uh, got him out of there. He didn't want to, once they voted him out, he didn't want to leave. But the um, ECOWAS uh, came there and Senegal rolled his tanks in there and then um, blocked some of the major um, uh, streets to let him see what he was up against. And they came there and just sat there to let him know 
that he had to go. And then Yahya um, Jameh finally uh, decided that he had to leave the uh, country. And he, I understand he's now in, um, in uh, Guinea-Bissau. I think that's where, he, where, he, where he's housed right now. But um, when I go in other parts, parts of the world, and I've been in 17 countries in Africa, <clears throat> I find that uh, politicians are the same way that I go. And I want to say something about that, too, as far as it relates to this discussion we're having right now about um, um, this country being great and so on and so forth. Um, I heard uh, when I got back here, I, I, I was uh, going back over some of the videos that I had missed while I was abroad. And one of the uh, one of the videos I was watching was this, these comments made by Governor Cuomo and his uh, son, I think it is, on CNN. Two peas out of the same pot. And I want to make a point about, I want to uh, say something about um, the comment that Cuomo made. Of course, he'll never be president now he made the comment about uh, this country has, uh, uh, has that, that making this country great again is impossible because this country has never been, been that great. The country, the country has been great, and the country is great, great now. Uh, what we've never had is that we've never have a, had a government that was great. We never had government that was great in this country, and that's not where the greatness is found in any country on the planet. If it is, you tell me where it's located. Governments are not great. Governments are the problems on the planet. And they're the problems on the planet because the governments are run by a teller. You see, when you say great, go back and look at these persons that were called great. Alexander, the great. Constantine, the great. Peter, the great. Catherine, the great. And why are they called great? They're called great because each one of them was an excellent example of a teller. They're great because they killed a lot of people. And I'll make this point. And the only reason why when uh, Farrakhan called Hitler great, the only reason why there was such an objection to it, no objection to Alexander being great, and no, ex no one making an outcry when they called Constantine great. But the reason why there's an objection to calling Hitler great, because he was Attila also, so was Alexander, so was Constantine, so was Catherine, so was Peter the Great. They, the reason why there's no objection to calling the others great, but an objection to calling Hitler great, is because Alexander, Peter, Catherine, Constantine, they kill Africans and Asians. Hitler killed Europeans. And that's the difference. And that's who politicians are. All politicians are, to one degree or another, all politicians are Tiller. Ivan de Turbo, uh, <laughs> Tiller the Hun, that's who they are behind the masking. And to one extent or another, that's how they rule. And this idea you're waiting on them to do other than what they're doing. And uh, of course, they, uh, you know, when I'm in Africa and I'm discussing these things with, with, these, with, with, with uh, people on the African continent, they're stunned because they can't say the things that we say over here. You cannot, this is what George Yeti is talking about in his, uh, in his works. They longs for the day. George, George Yete is from uh, Ghana. He works in one of the universities over here in the United States. He says he longs for the day where he can say in Africa what he says here in the United States. But that day has not come. And I don't see that day coming anytime soon because that is not how, how Africa allows for speech to be expressed uh, in, in Africa. Free speech in Africa is very, in many ways, is considered subversive. So when I'm over there and I'm talking uh, freely in Africa, saying things that the other population cannot say, and I've been in conversation with Africans uh, where I raise time, I sometimes forget about the limitations of freedom in Africa, and I begin to talk about some things, and they'll tell me, uh, we're having lunch, for example, with some people in Africa, and they'll, they'll say, uh, we're not supposed to talk about that. 
We're not supposed to talk about that. And I and I some I feel apologetic because I should have um, understood that I'm putting them in jeopardy by raising these questions and asking for political dialogue. But that's some things they cannot say and will not uh, talk about. But um, uh, and that day is not coming, Africa. I'm over there in, in, in Gambia, and I'm over there looking back at the United States. Okay, we got to take a break from the, take a hiatus from WFOV, and we will see you again on the other side of the break, and we'll see you in four minutes. Okay, we're going to continue what we're doing here, and I wanted to say that um, in, in continuing this discussion, I'm over in uh, Gambia, that's in uh, West Africa, and... I'm looking back from what I'm experiencing in Gambia and looking back at what I left when I left the United States. And I was over there um, talking about the situation in this country and then what I'm facing over in Gambia. And I give Gambia a lot of credit. They are uh, surviving some very terrible circ economic circumstances. I took my son over there and uh, I talked to him this morning, as a matter of fact. And he told me he is already, um, he, he told me he's going to work on uh, sending some shoes over there. And he said he's already collected um, 50 pairs of shoes he's going to ship back to Gammy. He said his, his goal is to collect 500 pair of shoes and he's going to ship those over to, uh, to Gammy. And um, I think he'll be able to accomplish that because he is... Um, a businessman, and he made a real big business splash when he was over there. Um, made a big splash in Africa. They are working working on some business ventures over there now, and um, I, I know I think he's going to get that done. But when I'm over there looking back at the United States, by contrast, you can help help but uh, see the uh, the nonsense that goes on in this country. I went, I'll give you an example. I was over there in, in, in Gambia. Uh, I'd go around, around the corner and another corner and then to the uh, store. And I went to uh, the village there and I told them that uh, I, while, I'm, while I'm there, these 10 days out, I'm there, I'll be buying uh, bread for everybody in the village, for all the children in the village. Not for everybody, but every, all the children in the village. And then some of the adults would come, and I bought them bread as well. I did that every day that I was there. And they're so appreciative of anything you do. And so every morning, the first, the first day I hit about 30. And then they go and tell their friends around the village area, and so you get 50, and then you probably, then uh, probably about... Um, I think at the end of, of my journey there, it was like 75 that came, and they were there on time. I went there. I made sure I was there every morning at the same time, 8 o'clock. I tried to get there at the same time that the bread guy would come. The bread would be warm. So when he would, I tried to get there when he would come, and I would pass the bread out from the, um, the motorcycle. They, they, drive a, they ride a, a motorcycle on the back of the motorcycle. They had a big basket that's full of bread. They delivered the bread to all the stores around the uh, surrounding area. Because that's how the Gambians, um, that's how the, the Gambians start their day, bread, bread and tea. The adults have bread and tea, the kids have bread. And then they have rice, <clears throat> uh, white rice, for every, in every meal uh, in Gambia, there's some rice dish. I don't think there's ever, I don't think there's, there was ever, there's ever a dish in uh, Gambia, a dinner, that does not include white rice. So, but bread in the at the beginning point, uh, which costs um, six uh, six dollars. Okay, I want, want to welcome the ones back from W for V. I want to thank you for coming back. And so, I'm just talking about my experience over in Africa, and I was in one of the poorest countries in Africa, and one of the um, safest countries in Africa. Gambia is a very safe country. Um, uh, my son, I was telling you, I went, took my son over. My son was, by the second day, my son, my son was walking all over uh, uh, Gambia, riding all over and making a lot of uh, contacts, met some business people over there. And I said, wow, it didn't take you long for you to, to uh, acclimate to, uh, uh, to uh, Gambia. 
And um, now they're talking about some business inroads. I think he's going to bring some technology uh, to Gambia because my son is in, in the technology. And they are already getting ready to um, bring uh, some technologies in terms of um, some of the housing over there. They're going to take the logic and also the security of the country. I think they're going to make some business deals with the government in uh, Gambia. And those uh, deals are well on the way based upon uh, some of the things that he did. He just simply came over there and took over in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and they liked him over there and uh, saw that he was down with um, trying to bring some improvements in the country. I think he's going to be able to do that. A lot of improvements. Already working on it. But uh, it's one of the uh, poorest countries in Africa. Everybody, everybody in Gambia, and when I say everybody, I don't mean 100%. I'm saying that by and large, Everyone in Gambia is hungry. But at the same time, Gambia is a very safe country, very low, very low uh, crime rate. And you can walk anywhere as a tourist and you're going to be safe wherever you are. In all those alleys you, that you go in, you go in these alleys where, you, where your housing is and you walk down these alleys, there's no street lights uh, in those alleys. You can't see folks coming towards you until they get right upon you. And there's no threat of them hitting you in your head and taking your money, although they know that you have money. The tourists that uh, come from Europe, because they know once they arrive in Gambia, they're safe. And um, I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I, I stayed inside a lot. Because when I went outside, I was getting broke because all you run into is need. People telling you that uh, they're, they're, they don't have any dollar C and they got these family uh, problems and um, they can't uh, do anything today because they don't have any uh, dollars. See? And you feel sorry. You, you know, you, you have money in your pocket. I brought some statues back. And uh, I could have done some very hard bargaining. Some sculptures that if you were selling them over here, they would be hundreds of dollars. And I could have bargained those things, down, those, those sculptures back down to uh, almost uh, nothing. But I, I was bargaining with a man that had tremendous skills. He learned it from his father. And I could have bargained it down to um, paying uh, almost nothing for it because he was desperate to sell where he could feed his family for that day. But that man had five, five family members. And so I gave him a very large price for it. People tell him, well, over here, you could, have, you could have bargained and paid this price. But if I had paid that price, the man could not have done what he needed to do for that day to feed his family. I was paying a higher price because I was bargaining and getting a deal, but I also wanted to deal with the needs of the, of the persons. They were selling me something. I gave them a fair uh, price. In Gambia, it was very fair. In America, it would be much higher. So I was uh, understanding the price over here. And I mean, some, you cannot believe the, 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 the skill level of those persons doing those sculptures. But I kept thinking about, while I was in Gambia, I kept thinking about the blacks in the United States who are over here whining. Oh, you're talking about uh, racism. And when you meet with Donald Trump, they want to uh, chastise those ministers that met with Donald Trump. They should have met with Donald Trump. They should ask him to do more. But they should, at the same time, ask the black community to do more. I saw that they said that the uh, Donald Trump's approval rating amongst blacks, I don't know where they pulled it, is allegedly up to 36%, which is probably higher than any other Republican I could ever recall having that rating. I, I don't think there was ever one that had, had anything close to that myself, but that just, I, I'm You're not an right. expert in it. You're reading it right, John. And... Uh, Donald Trump is going to be a two-term president, and we might as well get used to him being in the Oval Office because nothing they're doing is touching this man's uh, legacy. This man is a transformative president who is reaching out to the American people and pulling everybody up by having a hands-off approach to the government, taking these regulations off the book. These politicians are putting on there to create greater dependency in this country to make government more relevant in the lives of the American people where they can accept this government intrusion. This idea of the government, um, other people, by the people, for the people is what we have right now. We have government of the elite running the uh, government and running the country into the ground. 
We have big government, and Donald Trump is um, on the road, the pathway to getting government out of the lives to a large extent of the American people, and we need to, we need to encourage that. And we need to encourage this president to do more than he's, than he's doing, uh, although he's doing some things that, that Obama did not do. We need to get this government to do greater things to reduce the role of government in the lives of the American people and let the free market determine the uh, status of the country. To let the country breathe again. But um, when he meets with uh, these pastors, and they should have met with him, and they should not be out here apologizing for having met with this president just because some people like LeBron James doesn't like it or some people like Michael Eric Dyson doesn't like it. The president um, has reduced the unemployment rate in the black community, and the black community is doing much better under Barack uh, than they did under Barack Obama, and they're doing much better under Donald Trump than they did under the so-called first black president of the United States, who wasn't the first black president, by the way, if Jay Rogers works are right. Jay Rogers got a book called The Five Negro Presidents, and so that right there negates that idea that Obama was the first uh, black president. But, Don, but, but Barack Obama wasn't, wasn't a black president. Obama uh, was a white president. Because his father is not an American citizen, and he does not get a citizenship from his father. He got a citizenship from his mother. And I want somebody to show me how it is that a person that has an American mother who is white, who is running as president as an American citizen, how is he running as a black person when his daddy was not American. How does that happen? This is what I this is why I, I'm, I'm I claim that Obama was running under a, under a fraudulent claim. Obama was not a, a, a black president. Obama was a white president. And maybe you go by the uh, skin color and say, well, because of skin color, if you think that that's universally uh, recognized, you need to go to Latin America. I don't think that any, um, I don't think Mr. Obama would actually be able to be comfortable at sitting down and talking to the average black person. He would not be. I mean, but for one thing, he, um, let's face it, he went to the top-notch schools. Everything that allegedly they saw, you know, the privation from, he's never suffered any privation. Matter of fact, he's a world traveler. He's established in the communities and stuff like that. And he actually, he never actually did an honest day's work. And what I've seen of, maybe, you know, maybe he did, and maybe it's in his book or whatever, but I just, he's never worked like anything, any kind of job that didn't have any chance, promotions. He doesn't know how to struggle against that. I don't know where anybody could consider him to have the average black person's experience. I don't. He doesn't. He did, he did he's divorced from that. Yeah. Obama. Obama is a is a is a fraud, and I called him that in two thousand and nine after having voted for him. And uh, by February, I was out with Obama of two thousand nine. He took office January the twenty two thousand nine. By February, I had he had uncovered he had unmasked himself, and it was very clear who this man was. Although I wasn't voting for him because I believed the thing he talked about, I thought at least the man would get in office. And he would lower the racial temperature in the country. The man heightened the racial temperature. This was a divisional president. This was a divider in this country. And they're blaming Donald Trump as being a divider. Donald Trump is not dividing this country. The people that divided this country are the ones that would not accept the fact that we had an election in this country November the, November the 8th, 2016, and Hillary Clinton lost. And she lost fair and square because the American people went to the poll and did the same thing in 2016 that they did in 2008. They went and voted against the establishment. That's why Obama became president. And they voted against the establishment again in 2016. And the Russian then calls Obama to be elected president. And the Russian did not cause Trump to be president. The American people voted for Obama in 2008. They voted for Obama again in 2012. And they voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And they voted for uh, each of these men for the same reason. They were trying to bring somebody into the Oval Office from the outside. They did a miss in 2008. I voted for him too. But in 2012, you can believe this and bet your, your last dollar that I did not vote for Barack Obama in 2012. And that was the best vote that I could have cast 
in 2012. I didn't vote for uh, John McCain. I was voting against John McCain in 2008. And that was a good vote also. Although it wasn't a great vote because of who, who Barack Obama is. And, and I'll say it again as I've said it in the past. Barack Obama was a fraud then, is a fraud now. And I know you don't like me saying that. And I have to tell you something. I don't care if you like it or not. <laughs> I didn't come here. You know, I didn't come here to say what you like. And I could care less. Uh, <laughs> some of my former students uh, uh, think that they are uh, able to come into my space. Mrs. Marsh, you taught this. You taught black history. I didn't teach you to be a fool. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll take, take them on too. They're, they're not qualified to be in my space. And, they, and they're out here trying to teach. You look here, shut up. <laughs> so I'm over in Africa, right? And I'm looking back at all of these absurdities taking place in the United States from Africa. There are people over in Africa that have real needs. People that are wearing uh, beach uh, shoes because they can't afford regular shoes. We're going to send some shoes over there. Uh, for that, uh, to meet that need, but I, but but I, when I left here, I thought that these people that's over here kneeling on the football field, I thought that was you know uh, quite stupid. But over there, when I was in Africa, over in, G in Gambia, I saw it as an absolute absurdity. People making two point four million dollars on the average a year over here kneeling because they're claiming that there's no opportunity in the country. And over there, I'm having people tell me there's no work. Making uh, less than a dollar a day over in Gambia. Working five days a week, six days a week. Eight hours a day. And at the end of the uh, month, making an equivalent of, of about $37 just enough to buy a bag of rice, a 40-pound bag of rice, which they are uniquely able to do some things to have a diverse, diverse meals, although rice is the basis of all the meals. They're able to um, beat some peas, pound some peas into this little thing. They, they, beat the, they have a stick there. They beat the peas into a, a mush. They make a sauce out of it. Or they do some other things and make another meal. It's tremendous. It's, it's unbelievable how they create different dishes using rice as a base. And I saw real need over there. Then I see these, these, these silly uh, football players over here. Uh, you don't know how absurd that looks over there in Africa. People making millions of dollars over here, compl over here whining. Talk about uh, a lack of opportunity. Ain't seventy percent of the football players are black. Eighty percent of the basketball players are black, and blacks make up six and a half percent. Black males make up six and a half percent of the population of the United States, and they are thirteen times their percentage of the population on the football field making millions of dollars a year. And they're whining because not everybody's out there doing that. There are some blacks who don't make that kind of money. So therefore, discrimination explains it. But it doesn't explain why they're out there. They're over here whining, down here kneeling, talking about inequity and things of that sort. And over in Africa, there's some real inequity, and they're over there making it work as much as they can based on limited opportunity. I came here very dissatisfied with these uh, Negroes in this, in this country who are doing nothing but whining in this country and teaching our children to whine. Setting a bad example for these children. Got them over here kneeling. And they haven't even started their careers yet. They're over here kneeling rather than going to class and getting the skill level to be competitive. And they didn't taught them that. I'm over there looking at this, at this nonsense from afar. I'm over in Africa looking at this. You can believe every conversation I had in Africa, there were a lot of, uh, and it happens all the time in Africa, quite frankly, because 
people cannot believe the narrative is not fitting the, the, the narrative that they've been taught over there in Africa about what's happening in this country. They see all of these things uh, happening. They, they see the press, and they, they believe that um, uh, with, with their reading, they believe CNN. CNN is not uh, uh, news. CNN is, uh, is fake. So is MSNBC and NBC. The only network, quite frankly, that even remotely gets it right is Fox. And I know you don't like me saying that because Fox is supposed to be um, an outlaw. I, I talked to a person from Tan Tanzania while I was there, Tanzania. Or Tanzania. Uh, a person that was a second generation uh, Indian. He, he's, he's, uh, he was born in... Uh, he was born in India, second generation in India, was born in, in uh, Tanzania and, and East Africa. And we were talking about Jews and IRA and some of the persons that were there and um, at the moment when Tanzania gained its independence in the 1960s. And he had some very nice things to say about, um, nice things to say about Jews, Jews, uh, Jews and IRA. And um, very complimentary of, of um, some things that were happening at that time, not so much today. But, um, and, we, and we were just talking about some things that are happening in terms of uh, the black world. Blacks in America, the best fed blacks on the planet, the most high, highly paid blacks on the planet. And these Negroes over here denouncing people that are trying to tell them the truth, like Candace Owens, for example. And I saw her in a debate, it wasn't much of a debate, with uh, Michael Eric Dyson. This man, this man, is all he does is tell, is sell black people victimization. And Candace Owens took him on, on CNN. One of the real heroic uh, figures in this country. And I'm over there touting Candace Owens and Kanye West and some of the others, um, uh, 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 Dr. King's uh, niece, uh, the, who was the daughter of Dr. King's uh, brother, A.D. Uh, AD King, who was named, by the way, after um, the uh, grandfather on the, um, on the um, mother's side. He was the, uh, the, the, the grandfather to uh, Alberta King, Dr. King's um, mother. And so A.D. Williams, A.D. King is named after A.D. Williams. And his uh, daughter is one of the ones who sat there with those ministers that, at that meeting because she is in uh, Donald Trump's uh, corner. Not because Donald Trump is a, uh, a great uh, po politician. He's a great anti-politician. Politicians are not great. It's those that are standing up against politicians are great. And Donald Trump is doing that. And Mueller and all those others that are trying to bring Donald Trump down understand what Donald Trump is trying to do. And that's why they have not packed up and gone home and they continue to look for something they can bring charges against this man. You know, it's, it's interesting to, go, to get out of the country and look back at what's going on here. You go outside the country, you can see it very, more clearly when you're outside the country because you get away from, them, from, them, from the minutia. And I'm over in Africa looking at Mueller, looking at this jerk named uh, Brennan. Who, uh, <laughs> Brennan talking about Donald Trump is drunk with power because he took away this man's clearance. I hope Donald Trump takes the clearance away from every last one of these persons that was in the, uh, uh, Brennan was the director of the CIA. And that's all, and if you know this man's background, then you know something about what's happening in this country. This man voted for the Communist Party in 1980. How does this man who voted for Gus Hall in the, in the Communist Party in 1980, you tell me how a man with that background can be the head of the CIA. John Kerry, John Kerry 
who was one of the persons that was acting on the other side of Jane Fonda during the Vietnam uh, War. You can you can be um, have an opinion against uh, against the fighting of the war, but you can't stand up and undermine the troops as John Kerry did. How did he become Secretary of State? And then look at uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, who wrote a master's degree on um, on uh, Saul Alinsky. Her master's degree is on uh, Saul Alinsky. And she's an Alinskyite, the one that wrote the book called Rules for Radicals. How is she Secretary of State before John Kerry? He lets you see what was going on here. And Donald Trump intervened in that in 2016. This man stopped the bleeding of this country. And that's why all of them set up to, to oppose Donald Trump because he threw a monkey wrench in this country moving down the pathway to socialism. And Donald Trump has intervened in that. Doesn't mean he stopped the uh, train. He certainly slowed it down. And if he gets another term, we might have a chance to reverse the course of this country. When I came back here, I watched a program last night. I got here Saturday. I watched a program last night. Um, Life, Liberty, and Levine. And they had on there uh, Tom Coburn and a guy named um, um, Mark um, Merkel, who is over the Convention of States. Um, they're trying to get the Convention of States to uh, certify the calling of a convention, the Convention of States, which is what you really need to do in this country. You need to have a another convention. We have got to, in fact, bring the Congress, bring the government under um, repair. And we cannot do it through the electoral process. That much is clear. So I was very much attentive to what they were doing last night in the Mark Levine show, and they're exactly right. They got 12 states so far that are ratify, have, have uh, endorsed the Convention of States using Article 5 of the Constitution. Article 5 allows for another way to amend the Constitution because the framers, in their ultimate wisdom, understood that the government will at some point go out of control. How do they know that? Because that's been the history of government throughout the history of the world. Every government instituted, even as instituted among men, as said in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, every government in the history of the world has gone out of control. And they've gone out of control for the same reason. They're run by politicians. They're run by the parasites. And that's who politicians are. Ayn Rand calls them Attila. They are that too. And the framers, understanding that, put in place a way that when government goes out of control, the people have a remedy. And the remedy is for them to call a convention, as what they did the founding of the country, to go around the government and the people themselves call a convention of states to meet to rectify the government once it goes out of control. And that is what they put in Article 5 in order to amend the Constitution by going around Congress so that the people can amend it by the states calling a convention. It takes two-thirds of the states, 34 states, 34 state legislatures to petition Congress for the convening of a convention and then the convention of states meet and they can amend the Constitution of the United States so as to corral the, the government and bring it back under control of the Constitution of the United States. The framers put that provision in place because they knew at some point the government would go out of control and it's going out of control. And this idea of voting for this party or that party as a way of running government back in is not going to, is not going to work because both parties are corrupt. And all the politicians in Washington are corrupt. The government is out of control in Washington. And that's because there are no statements, there are no statesmen uh, in the government. And when you go outside the country and you look back at what's happening here, you can see the absurdity of it. 
And I was in Africa there for, for 10 days watching a government operating the way it operates in Africa and seeing that this um, corruption is taking place there. And I saw it on a larger scale in, in, in Africa where it's the same thing here but on a grander scale because they have much more play money to, um, to do things that are untoward and, and that are outside of the uh, owners of law. More things to do with more money to do it with. And so therefore the corruption is greater here than it is in Africa, certainly uh, greater than it is in, in, in Gambia, which is a poor nation. But we look at it and we, and we have to see that the conditions here, no matter how much we say is out of control and so on and so forth. It is much better here for blacks than it is on in any African country on the African uh, continent. And over here, the whining that you see is just, it's just disgusting when you understand the real need that you have, that you meet in Africa. So I'm back now to, from a 10 day hiders in Africa, and I'm looking forward to, um, talking a lot more about what I experienced over there on the continent of Africa, but you'd be surprised of the suffering that's going on over there. And the blacks over here in America, you don't know how well you have it. None of you can survive the things that I saw over there in Africa and make a, a go of it based on the, on the limited opportunities over there. Okay, we're back now and ready to go forward. Hope you stay tuned to new programs as we come forward over the course of, of the next few uh, weeks. Until next week, I want you to follow your dream, because if you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.